Hello and welcome to Letters Home, a story of a World War II B-17 pilot from Lowell, Michigan in his own words, and he just so happens to be my grandpa. I'm your host, Annie Whitlock, and I'm joined by my co-host, my dad, Mitch McMahon, my aunt, Lori Summerfield, and Dale Croft from the Lowell Historical Museum. In each episode of Letters Home, we're going to dive into letters written by my dad during his time in World War II that he sent to his parents, siblings, and friends back home in Lowell, Michigan. We'll be reading his own words and giving some context as to what was happening in the world and in Lowell at the time he wrote these. In this episode, Dad writes about his run-up to getting his commission, including a lot of uncertainty about where he's going next. And we still have a lot of uncertainty about who Kitty is. Yeah, we do. Thought we solved that one, but we'll get there. <laughs> um, yeah, so before we get into it, as always, we have our corrections and additions, and we love this. The additions just keep flowing in. Uh, we have another addition about Dora Thomas. So this was, Dora Thomas was like a one line mention in one letter, and now all of a sudden we've learned so much about her and about Bruce through that. So um, we had a listener, Tom Doyle, reach out to the Lowell Historical Museum to give us some more information about Dora. Apparently, Dora Thomas was in the same high school class as Bruce, and she loved to write letters, which explains why she was writing to Bruce, and he felt he needed to get back with her. So Dora and her husband, Jim Cook, which we learned last week, they, they ran a dairy farm on Virgins in Lincoln Lake for many years, so we didn't learn that last week. And the best part about this, though, is that Tom shared a picture with us of Bruce's freshman class in high school which we're going to put on our YouTube video and Instagram because it has Dora in it, obviously, Bruce, but also Jack Lally, who keeps coming up on this podcast, <laughs> and more to come on him, too, sure. and Tom's uncle, also named Tom. So this is great. Send pictures, definitely, if you have evidence. We, we need those. We love it. So this is great. I love learning about Lowell people. Yeah. from everybody else. So thank everyone for listening. Uh, if anybody listens and has an addition or a correction or knows the names of people in this podcast that we don't know, comment, message us, email the Lowell Historical Museum. Um, there's a lots of different ways to flag us down, and then we will read it or rectify our mistakes if we have them in a future episode. Is there anything else that we, that we missed or needed to add? I think we've been... I don't want to jinx it. Not too bad lately. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, in this episode, Bruce is now in his final days in flight training, and he's about to become an officer with his commission. Problem is, he doesn't know where he's going next or if he'll get to leave to come home anytime soon in between. Um, so that's what a lot of these letters are about this week. So in his own words. Wednesday night, dear mother and dad. Well, I wrote this morning, and because it's raining cats and dogs, I'll write again. We went over to the flight line at 7 tonight, and it looked like it might rain. This afternoon it was rough and a few black clouds, but it didn't look, look like it would storm so violently. Just as we were going over to the parachute room, it started to rain, and the overcast moved down to about 500 feet. Well, things really let go then. Rain, buckets of it, lightning, thunder, and just a good old Michigan spring storm. Now it's 10 and it's still storming. Makes my room kind of cozy-like. Tomorrow this desert clay will be nothing but a sea of mud. In looking over your letter again, I read, I awoke and felt so good because I knew you weren't flying. Gosh, I hope you don't live in dread of my flying. At best, it's kind of a lonely job. Two of you up there checking off lights, fan markers. But in a way, it's kind of nice. You can always tune in the radio into some program. It's warm in the ship, and these nights are really beautiful, excepting nights like tonight. It isn't all that dangerous if you know what you're doing. Believe me, I'm careful because I want to get home when this is over, and all in one piece. Please try not to worry too much. Next week will be really busy, a really busy one. Finishing, flying, graduation parties, graduation itself, getting packed to leave, getting the sheets of papers and orders an officer needs when he leaves a post, and a hundred other things. As yet, I haven't bought a new bag, the supplement, the case that the Army gives, gives us. But when I do, I'll ship the old one back. Don't forget to find out where Camp Luna is for me. I'll try to see Charlie if you do. Just found out, find out what town it's near. According to Army regulations, an officer isn't supposed to fraternize with an enlisted man on a post. But in case of an old friend, it's different. I think maybe I'll hit the hay now. Good night, and I love you. 
your loving son, Jay Bruce. Yeah, his hmm. family's worried about him. Yeah. Doesn't want him to fly. And he doesn't like that. Yeah. He but he does, of course him. he doesn't like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought this part about an officer not being allowed to talk to an enlisted man was interesting. I yeah. guess, yeah. And then he says, if you're friends, then it doesn't matter. But I didn't really think about that. Mm. I don't know. Now he's a big man, big officer now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he wants to visit Charlie. Charlie Hausman must yeah, be, right? I we think determined so. last week. So that's nice. Yeah. Um, on the top of this letter, he draws a picture of his, like, commissioner wings, his officer's wings, and then he writes, nine more days till, and then draws an arrow to the wing. So he's <laughs> counting down to his graduation. Oh, so he cool. kind of doodles that on the top of the letter. So you can see this with all of Bruce's letters on the Lowell Historical Museum website. And as Bruce gets closer to graduation, he's thinking about when he's going to get to see his family again. So in his own words... Sunday night, 11 o'clock. Dear mother and dad, I'm waiting to go to the flight line. We eat dinner at 11.30 tonight and have breakfast when we finish flying at 6 tomorrow morning. This schedule will continue until we are finished. I should have all my time completed by tomorrow night's flying. Kind of sounds screwy with a schedule like this, but it's necessary in order to finish on time. This afternoon, I tried to call out there. There was a three-hour delay at Tucson, so I figured it's hopeless. I'll get you next Sunday if I have to wait all day. Because if everything goes okay, you'll be talking to your flying officer, son. Graduation is a really busy time around here. A lot of the fellows have their wives or mothers and fathers down to see them graduate. It's nice to have your folks to graduation, but I'm sure glad none of my people are coming. It's almost impossible to get rooms in Douglas, and it seems a waste of time and money to spend four or five hours together and then have to leave again. I'm not planning on any leave until after I get to my next post, and I suspect that will be Salt Lake City. When we arrive there, we stay in town until we are given our tactical post. Then if everything breaks right, they give you 10 days to report to the next post. It's then that I'll hop an airliner for home. I inquired the other night when I was in El Paso on a cross country at the terminal about reservations and prices on the trip home. From El Paso to Detroit, it runs about $90. I'll probably be leaving Salt Lake, so, I'll, I'll, it'll, so possibly it'll be a little cheaper. At any rate, I hope to have at least that much on me, so I don't think I'll have to send for any. It's a cinch that after I get my month's officer's pay, I'll be off, well off. 250 smackers ain't bad. You'll have to tell the rest of the family that I won't be writing too much for the, week, for the next week or so. I'll probably be on a train from tonight. If I get Charlie's address before then, I'll, I'll try to go on a railroad that will take me up his way. If I go through Tucson, I'll look up Eddie Gallant and chew the fat with him for a few hours. He wrote me last week, and if I get time, I'll let him know where I can see him. Funny as it seems, I fly into Tucson Beam about every night on cross country, but I've never scheduled to stay there any length of time. I'll find time to write you uh, every couple days until I get to the new post. All my love and prayers, your loving son, Jay Bruce. Yeah, so he's clearly busy. So he's wrapping up his time in Arizona, and, and it looks like he's going to make a pit stop in Salt Lake City, then head to, from there, head to where he's going to be for a while. Um, makes me sad he didn't want to s anyone to see him graduate, but I guess well, it would I think be a he was short saying trip. That anyway, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like he really, yeah, maybe he did, but he didn't want them to think it was like a they long had trip to come, to come out yeah, there. Didn't goodness. want them feeling guilty about not trying to make the trip or something. Yeah, but. yeah, that's true. Did anyone? Does anyone know who Eddie Gallant? Eddie Gallant? We don't know I how to pronounce yeah. it either. No. Um, anyone know maybe who that is? Maybe one of our listeners. Well, uh, okay. This is your opportunity, listeners, if you know who this is, yeah. <laughs> to let us know. And, yeah, if you have pictures, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Send them on in. Probably a friend of his, though, maybe, or could have also been someone in the Army, too, that he'd been with before. Yeah, we don't really know. Don't really know. But he's going to chew the fat. So that's a phrase <laughs> I haven't heard in a long time. Oh. Chew the fat with him. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to read <laughs> another letter from February 3rd, which is the last one before Bruce graduates and gets his commission. So, in his own words. Wednesday, dear mother and dad, fingerprints, photographs, identification papers, flight ratings, special orders, flight pay, vouchers, etc., etc. Maybe this will give you a fair idea of some of the things I'm doing today and tomorrow. I'm all through flying now. Next time up, I will, will be as an officer. I sent out a mess of announcements, practically all of my friends, but it's okay. There's no obligation about presents or etc. connected with them. I'm sending home my old bag full of old stuff I won't be using now. You can stow it, stow it for me. Someday I'll get a kick out of it. 
Still hoping for 10 days at my new post. If I get them, it'll be sometime in March that I'll be that I'll get home. Incidentally, I can get all the gasoline and tires I need now as I'm a flying officer. Might take the car if I figure on being in this country for five or six months. Anyway, I'll know when I get home. Sorry this is so short, but boy, am I busy. All my love and prayers, your loving son, Jay Bruce. Aww, so he's maybe expecting to go overseas. We kind of hear it because he's maybe only expecting to be in the country for five or six months. Mm-hmm. We sort of caught that. Um, yeah. So, but we <laughs> would get a kick out of the little bag of stuff. I know that I he wish, would stow. I so, wish, yeah, I wish. Aunt Lori, anything in your basement? That I haven't, we have se- a I haven't seen a bag. No, I haven't <laughs> seen a bag. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, because that would be great. We would get a kick out of it for sure. All right, well, it's time for our segment where we talk about what was going on in the world and in Lowell when Bruce wrote these letters. So, around the world and in Lowell in February 1943, rationing was in full effect. Uh, Bruce mentions even that now that he's an officer, he won't have to ration gas or tires, so he can get as much as he wants. But I learned that shoes were the latest thing joining the rationing um, in February of 1943. And, of course, we have our historian, Dale, to tell us about rations about on shoes. Yeah, well, they didn't have to worry about Nike shoes back then. That's <laughs> okay, for yeah, sure. that's true. <laughs> Shoe rationing. The Office of Price Administration, the OPA, on February 9th, 1943, began rationing shoes as a result of the war's effort need for materials. The rationing was a response to shortage of rubber for shoe soles. Oh, that's your tongue twister. That is. <laughs> shoe soles. There we go. <laughs> Each man, woman, and child could purchase up to three pairs of leather shoes a year using designated stamps in a war ration book one and later in books three and four. For example... Coupon number 17 in ration book one was good for one pair of shoes between Tuesday, February 9th and Tuesday, June 15th. (laughs) And then they couldn't get any shoes until they got into book three, ration book three and four. Oh. And there was coupons. There'll be a picture um, on our YouTube. Shoemakers were prohibited from making formal evening slippers, men's patent leather shoes, and many types of sports shoes. Leather colors were limited to black, white, brown, and army russet. Okay. Heels Still on women's shoes. a lot of colors, I yeah, feel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Heels on women's shoes were limited to a height of 2.58 inches. We talked about that earlier in one of our other okay. rationing. Um, secondhand shoes didn't count against the limits. People who had essential jobs that required a lot of walking, like police officers or mail carriers, could buy extras. If someone lost their shoes in, say, a fire or <laughs> as part of a robbery, they could get an ex- exception to the ration, though they had to fill a, a long form to do it. And I saw the form, and, yeah, wow. I don't know. I might have gone barefoot, I guess, maybe if I had to fill it out. Anyway, Thanks. there was another exception. Shoes that didn't use any leather or rubber were exempt from the limits, too. So another piece of rationing here in the good old WW2 days. Yeah. Wow. Okay, shoes that didn't use leather or... Yeah, what would those be? Wooden. Wooden yeah, shoes. I don't know. <laughs> People in Holland were cool. Wood, yeah. I guess. Dutch, Holland, I don't know. Wood shoes, wood shoes. Just make your own. Material. Yeah, uh, yeah moccasins are be? leather. Yeah. yeah, they're suede. So I was like, oh, geez, what would that be? And and wow. the ration books were... Uh, I, I have a, a picture of ration book one with coupon 17 in it. It's There's like, I think, 20, 25 coupons in each book. And each one was... You had to use for certain things. So I feel like I'm constantly buying my kids' shoes, so I don't know yeah. how we could go like a, a one year yeah. with just one uh, pair of shoes. You'd have to. It'd be I disintegrated guess. on their feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be any big hardship for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Looking at my shoes right now, I'm thinking, no, okay. <laughs> You've had the same shoes yeah, for, this for is, a very long time. This so. is 2019. Oh, my Lord. Well, being a golfer, I don't know. I'd have oh, a hard yeah. time without mm-hmm. And baseball. I mean, baseball oh, was a big... So baseball shoes, they couldn't have metal, yeah. nothing with metal cleats or anything okay. like that. They, you were, have. they cut back on sport, yeah. sport stuff. Yeah, Yeah. well, yeah. there was some sports. That's right. Baseball and football yeah, and all that stuff really was playing. gone. Yeah, and okay. golf and all that stuff was gone. Oh, well, <laughs> shoes, another casualty yeah. and a sacrifice And of the evening war. slippers. I wear those all the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, another one of the biggest issues, another sacrifice on the home front during this time, just in general and in Lowell, um, was the shortage of workers. 
I mean, many men are off fighting in the war, and as the war goes on, it's like more and more each time, and that leaves fewer people back at home in cities and in small towns like Lowell to cover the work that needs to be done. We already kind of read about this in um, the last couple episodes that Frank was sort of feeling this at Lowell Light and Power as people that worked there were going off to war. And actually, President Roosevelt ordered a 48-hour work week in some cities. So kind of requiring people to work an extra day a week, like if you were behind, like left behind here, like and not out in the Army. So I was curious about other about Lowell during this time and kind of the shortages that, other than maybe Lowell Light and Power, that, <laughs> that we're experiencing this, like, employee shortage. Yeah, the labor shortage was, was a problem everywhere, and Lowell was no exception. Uh, on February 9th, 1943, as Annie mentioned, President Roosevelt issued an executive order mandating a 48-hour work week. The order was applied to 32 labor shortages areas that Roosevelt listed. listed. In those areas, the 48-hour week was applied to all employment, including retail stores, newspapers, and domestic servants. The War Manpower Commission expected there to be a total of 102 areas with labor shortages by the end of the war. The labor shortages were primarily caused by a large number of men joining the military, which we've talked about, leaving a significant gap in the workforce, coupled with a rapidly expanding war industry that required a massive influx of workers in factories leading to a high demand for labor in both military and civilian sectors, particularly in agriculture and manufacturing industries. The key factors that contributed to labor shortages were the military draft, which we talked about. Millions of men were drafted into the armed forces, leaving their previous vacant jobs across various industries. War production expansion, the rapid scaling up of war production in factories required a large workforce exceeding the available civilian labor pool. Shift to war-related industries, many workers left traditional jobs, your mother will be a good example of that, to take high-paying positions in war-related industries like shipbuilding and aircraft manufacturing. Rural labor drain, and that's where Lowell got hit, Farm workers, particularly young men, left agricultural jobs to join the military, leading to shortages in food production. And demographic factors, age restrictions on military service meant that younger men were primarily drafted, leaving a gap in the working age uh, production. Uh, how, the, how we address those, how the government addressed those shortages, women entering the workforce, which many did. Governments encouraged women to join the workforce through campaigns like Rosie the Riveter, mm-hmm. filling positions previously held by men, and Margaret was one of them. Mm-hmm. Minority groups mobilization. Efforts were made to integrate African Americans and other minority groups into the workforce to address labor shortages. Government programs, and we talked about this last week, one of them, the programs like the Brochero program, which established to bring in temporary foreign workers to fill agricultural labor gaps. And War Manpower Commission, this, this was brought up in uh, the ledger, a couple of the articles I found in the ledger. Government agencies like the War Manpower Commission was created to manage labor allocation and address workforce shortages. Then digging into our local paper at that time, I found uh, several articles. One talked about farmers face, are faced with a severe labor shortage. The American Army in the last war, World War I, numbered 3,673,888 men on November 11, 1918. Mm-hmm. Now they're talking about projections were up to 10 million mm-hmm. man force. And we, wow. we were amazed by that last week when it was 8 million something, right? Maybe yeah, we talked about numbers. To Michigan workers in the industrial defense, approximately 400,000 are going to be needed. So this brings in what your, what your mob became part of. Uh, The Ford bomber plant at Willow Run is expected to employ 12,000 to 20,000 women. Mm -hmm. And Margaret was one of them. That was one. Another article I found that that titled, uh, Ask uh, Ask Farmer Help to Produce Lumber. Sawmills uh, were part of the uh, rural area at that time, and farmers were being asked to help out uh, sawmills because they lost labor to keep the production up for the war effort. Uh, uh, what was another one? A couple of, oh, I, this one was interesting. C.H. Runchman's company, the bean company mm-hmm. factory, had an ad in the paper, and at the top of the paper was uh, a picture of a young uh, 
adolescent child, well, a teenage child and, and male, female with rakes. And then it kind of grew up to uh, moms and dads with rakes. And it says, we pay tribute to the men and women, boys and girls on the farms in this area who are doing their part in producing bumper crops of wheat, corn, beans, and other crops needed for victory. Yeah. And then farther down, it has order fertilizer. It says the fertilizer companies are urging farmers to take their fertilizer or get their fertilizer early because of the labor shortage and plants. So right there's an ad of, right from C.H. Runsman. There was another article called War Production Committee Meets in Lowell. They had their own little committee. Oh, okay. Okay, with the War Production Program, which was the, the government, uh, they were talking about what was going to be requested production for 42 and 43, et cetera, with less farm machinery and with uh, possible labor shortages to contend with. Mm -hmm. That was part of the Lowell community. Farmers facing huge problem to roll up sleeves to beat food goal. Uh, that was uh, talks about that once again the shortage of farm labor and the machinery, and uh, they're just going to have to roll up their sleeves and work harder to meet the productions of um, <laughs> to meet the demands of the war <laughs> man. Crazy. Wow. And the other thing that happened in town at that time in 1943 was the big King Milling fire. That burnt oh yeah, King Milling Company on March March 1943, and um, there was an ad in the paper from them asking for extra help to help them pour the new silos it was going to go to well, just like they poured the you know, yeah, recent we're ones need to talk it more was about that, yeah it was 24/7 sure. they poured cement 24 hours a day then and they were asking local people to come and help and support so that they could produce enough wheat to meet the war effort or meet the war production program stuff so there's all kinds of all kinds of things happening all over all the little communities in the area and law was no different yeah. What a time of but the poor farmers, really, I mean, they were asked to do a lot. I mean, it seems like they were just, you know, every article I read dealt with farmers and machinery not being available. And you got to meet this food guild and, you know, hopefully. Yeah, but fewer people there to help you even. Yeah, that, that ad on C.H. Runsman I'll have on the um, YouTube thing. It's, it's pretty cool. I'll have to get a good copy of it from the... I'll have to go down to the museum and pull out the actual copy of the ledger, and so it has a nice picture. So, right. wow! But that's pretty pretty neat. I, you haven't seen it, but it's uh, the the families. Uh, there they are at the top with the rakes and yeah, those are help. a couple of young. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's all the way up from like junior high to you know. It was we a need whole, some child like labor a, to help. You can hold a rake. You can help. Yeah, I guess so. It looks like a family, a regular family helping the effort. So, okay. there we go. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Absolutely. A lot of volunteer hours were put in, obviously. Yep. Yeah. Well, Bruce writes writes about this, writes about Frank's, per in particular, lack of help at the power plant um, in a letter at actually like the end of January 1943. And he also has some other Lowell news in this letter as well. So, Dad, why don't you take this one in his own words? Just this minute received your letter of Monday. Fellow in the next room brought it to me. Well, so it's Francis Joseph. Not bad, not bad. I like the name, and he's bound to be quite a guy with his grandpappy's name. Gee, I'm sorry about Mrs. Dennis. She, she was always such a swell person. In fact, name me one in the whole family that isn't. Kitty makes me believe that God gives to people just what worldly grief he thinks is possible for them to take. It's a cinch that he has quite a high regard for Kitty. Whenever she was feeling tough back in the good old days, I, I could never tell by her disposition. She always had a grin and a slap on the back for you, regardless of how she felt. Well, Dad, things must be pretty tough for you now without any help to hire. Nevertheless, I don't want you out there shoveling snow and then getting your rest with the rum crowd, as Burns said. Darn it all, it's about time you could take things a little easier. But knowing you, I guess you wouldn't be living unless you were, could do all the things and still have energy to spare. We were uh, talking, three fellows and myself, yesterday about our dads, and I won all the arguments. All I had to do was tell them a few things you did a day, then your diversions at night, then your age, and they all shut up. It seems for, funny for these fellows to be talking about their dads being old, all the way from 50 to 59. When I said my dad was just in his middle age prime of over 72, they couldn't believe it. <laughs> if I have half your pep at 50, I'll be satisfied. Guess I have to go now. All my love and prayers, your loving son, Jay Bruce. <laughs> I love this little anecdote about Frank, but, um, and I remember Bruce being pretty 
having that pep over 52. Oh, well, sure. You yeah. know, I, he right. did. So he's saying I'd be half, if I have half your pep at 50, I think he did. I remember well, sure. that about him. Well, he better have because uh, he had me when I was, when he was 44. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. He needed to have that pep when I was nine or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And especially when you were 15. Yeah. That's yeah. Hilarious. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the rum crowd made me laugh yeah, too. I, what is that about? I don't know. I'd like to know more about that. Well, that's, uh, somebody's going to have to tell us about that Who's one. Who's the rum crowd? Yeah. Is that just a common phrase of the time? Um, oh, that's a good point. I don't know. I just, I just I didn't actually think that don't Grandpa was a heavy drinker. Or well, and I don't understand quite a, we, because we don't know what it is. The context of shoveling snow and then getting your rest with the rum crowd. You yeah. mean the rum crowd being maybe people who are out late at night? Yeah. It and he talks about like his diversion that night. Working all day and then going out for a diversion. Out. Yeah. Going I, out I to don't grab know. a drink? Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe I just, when I knew him, he wasn't a drinker, but then that was, you know, or, yeah, it was quite a I, few years after 72, yeah. <laughs> or maybe just getting his, just the, the comparison of the fact that Grandpa would have been up that late, and then, oh. you know, that's when he gets his rest, is with the same, the rest is when the rum crowd gets their rest, which is at two in the morning, you Oh, know, that's a good way to, mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't think I, about it that way, that makes sense. So like in just in general, like just in general, you're you're working all day, and then you're going to get your rest when that rum crowd gets their rest, which is it, you know. All <laughs> when hours they stumble the home from the bar, then you'll go to bed. Yeah. Oh well, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, know. it could be a lot of different things. See, yeah. This is half the fun of trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. And we learn that this is the official record of Baby Frank. Yeah. <laughs> being named for the Elder Frank, yeah. Francis Joseph. Yeah. Um. So very cute. Uh, but we also have more complications, though, in this kitty mystery. <laughs> um, so I, because this is also fun for me to, I'm a big history nerd with this. I <laughs> had to do some digging on what was, like, what kitty are we talking about? Because now I'm starting to think that it is not the family friend necessarily that Annette knew, Kitty Lally, Jack Lally's aunt. Um, I think this is a different kitty. So I actually, so I started with, I found Mrs. Dennis in the ledger because, as you know, um, everyone's injuries are always published in the newspaper <laughs> in 1942. So it was not remotely difficult to look at the ledger and find, just search for Dennis. And I was like, oh, yeah, there she is. Um, oh she broke gosh. her hip or something. I don't know. That's what it is. Uh, and the ledger said that Mrs. Dennis was cared for by her daughter, Kitty Charles. So I think that that is obviously who Bruce is referring to here. Okay. Um, some more Googling led me to find out that it was Kitty Charles who worked at the power plant. Okay. It was Kitty Charles who was married to Bert and that sent Bruce a Christmas gift. Yeah. And we talked about that. Yeah. Um, so there must have been two kitties. And actually, like super sad, Bert died like right after Christmas after sending that those presents to really? to Bruce. Like he had just passed away and then her mom got hurt. So that's why he's talking about oh, what God giving um you more oh, than you can oh, handle grief. or yeah, something. Yeah. Or yeah. So oh, poor kitty had been sense. through okay. a lot in the last couple months. Um but there's so there must be two kitties. We must have Kitty Charles, who was at the power plant, and Kitty Lally, the family friend. Now we still don't know who which one he was writing to that first day at Santa Ana, but this definitely took a turn because I didn't count on there being more than one kitty that we, <laughs> we, we connected to Bruce. That's right. Um, so, yeah, does Kitty Charles ring a bell to any of you? Mm -mm. No. no. Okay. No. Well, there we go. Yeah. And clearly, she's probably pretty important at this point because Frank doesn't have anybody else to work at the power plant, right? So yeah. she's a woman in law, like, ready to work. So yeah, put her to work. But yeah. So we <laughs> thought we solved the kitty mystery, and then it complicated things. So mystery kind of solved, maybe, mm -hmm, maybe somewhat, unless a third kitty appears somewhere, and we <laughs> don't know. <laughs> oh my God. I have no idea. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness, yeah. Well, you're filling in the blanks. I'm trying my best. You know, it's kind of fun to <laughs> mess around. I'm this close to sending my DNA in to go get the, <laughs> the 23 and me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was stop. Maybe I won't. Maybe I won't quite go that far. We'll see. Uh, we're gonna finish today with. Bruce's first letter he writes after graduating and after getting his official wings. So Bruce gets his wings in his own words. Thursday, dear mother and dad, I have a few minutes till train time, so I'll try to tell you what's happened since I arrived in Salt Lake City. 
For the last two days, I've been out to the post getting my papers straightened out. My new assignment is Blythe Air Army Air Base, Blythe, California. If you check it on the map, it's sort of godforsaken country. However, I'll be doing a lot of cross-country flying, so I don't expect it to be too dull. The airplanes will be the Flying Fortress most of the time, but I'll also be flying the B-24 Liberators. As I've thought all along, there won't be any leaves given. I know a few pilots were given 10 days, but all four engine men are not given any. I'm a bit disappointed, but this is war and flying these big jobs makes up for some of the breaks. I just hope you people aren't too disappointed. Tonight at 11, I couldn't wire this because all the movements are secret, I'll leave on the train. I'll travel in a stateroom with another officer. And now that I'm commissioned, etc., I travel the best as it's all arranged for me by the post. This is a darn poor excuse for a letter, but it's the best I can do until I get settled. I should arrive in Blythe sometime Saturday. Dad, don't worry about my going across. It won't be for quite a few weeks, and I'll get home somehow before then. All my love and prayers, your loving son, J. Bruce. Oh, so yeah. all the uncertainty from the top of the episode about when he's going to get leave, it's all revealed. He's going to Blythe, California, but... He's well, not getting leave. He's not getting leave. He's not going to be going home anytime soon. So. Yeah, he says, as I thought all along. There, yeah, I kind of thought he kind of thought he was going to get some leave. Yeah, there. yeah, so. yeah. Because he, I mean, he did all did all that research about like flight yep, prices. Yep, so like he was really counting on it. So yeah. clearly, I mean, I could feel the disappointment like reading yep. this letter. Mm. Um, yeah, and I was like, oh man, and I even know what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know that he does get leave eventually, but I, even I was very disappointed because I can just imagine, you know, like you're thinking how they were feeling. Yes, yeah, it's sure. almost done. This is almost done. I'm going to get my commission. I'm going to get to see people for, and then it's yeah. like, no, go right back to work. But at least he gets to fly the big planes. He says, <laughs> like that yeah. makes up for it. Yep. So yeah. we'll learn more in our next episode about Blythe Army Air Base because he's there for a little while before he goes across, as he says. So thank you for listening to Letters Home. We hope you continue to listen as we go through Bruce's story. You can listen to Letters Home on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or the Lowell Historical Museum website and YouTube channel. New episodes drop every Thursday. The Lowell Historical Museum has digitized versions of Bruce's letters, so you can read them in full, along with primary sources for most of the people, places, and events we've talked about here today, plus more. You can also follow the Lowell Historical Museum on Facebook and the Letters Home podcast on Instagram at Letters Home Lowell. Thank you to Roger McNaughton for our podcast music and to WRWW 92.3 FM for letting us record in their studio at Lowell High School every week. Tune in or stream WRWW at LowellRadio.org. See you next time.